Welcome to the MSU Deer Labs online seminar series brought to you by Mississippi State University Extension Service and the Forest and Wildlife Research Center. My name is Steve Damaris and I'm the Taylor Chair in Applied Big Game Research and Instruction at Mississippi State University. Thanks for joining me today. Nutrition really does matter, but is it only nutrition that's affecting this uh, relationship that we've seen among the regions? Or could it be due to genetics? Now, if, if you're old enough, you know the guy on the left is Michael Jordan, one of the greatest basketball players ever to exist. And uh, the actor on the right uh, is uh, kind of dressed up like a, an athlete, but uh, uh, he's not going to be a very good basketball player. He's about five feet tall and uh, doesn't look like he could jump very high. So uh, genetics certainly uh, determines a lot of things in life, uh, but we have shown that nutrition certainly varied among the three regions. But we have this uh, subspecies taxonomy that was still a little bit of a problem for us. 50, 70 years ago, you know, in the early 1900s even, uh, taxonomists were scientists that studied the relationships among animals. And uh, white-tailed deer are a species of deer. The taxonomic name for white-tailed deer is Odocoileus virginianus. And within North America, there's uh, about over 30 different subspecies of white-tailed deer. For example, Odocoileus virginianus macrurus, Odocoileus virginianus virginianus, which is in the, the light tan color. Uh, down in the bottom, and down in southern Florida, uh, there's a subspecies of deer. There's a subspecies in the upper part of Florida called Odocoileus virginianus osceola. Southern Louisiana, Odocoileus virginianus McElhaney. So the differences among these subspecies were documented and written about during the early or mid 1900s based purely on the morphology, the morphological differences in body size and skeleton size and antler size. And what we see in the state of Mississippi, if I could point out with my cursor, most of the state of Mississippi is Odocoileus virginianus virginianus, the Virginia white-tailed deer. And then down here in roughly the area that the lower coastal plain exists in the southern southeastern part of Mississippi is a subspecies described as Odocoileus virginianus osceola, or the osceola white-tailed deer. And this subspecies was differentiated from this one based on morphology or body size and antler size. So taxonomists said, well, there's a different subspecies of deer down here than there is here. And taxonomy doesn't necessarily mean genetic differences, but we had this differentiation of subspecies. And so what we had documented up to this point, the soil, the plants, the land use, helped explain it, but it didn't prove that there was no genetic difference in deer within the three regions. So, to finally answer this question, we had to do some manipulative research. We wanted to optimize nutrition and compare body and antler size among soil regions for two generations. So we wanted to take the, the genetic pool of deer from each of the three regions, raise them on the same optimum nutrition. And if there was a genetic difference, then their differences in body and antler size would remain even though the nutrition was improved. If there was equal genetic potential to grow big bodies and big antlers, providing all of the deer with the same optimum nutrition would allow for uh, compensation. 
So the, the lower coastal plain could grow as big as the Lurse Hills deer, and maybe even grow as big as the Delta deer. It's called compensatory growth uh, based on improved nutrition. So we needed to start with a sample of genetic, uh, the genetics of deer from each of the three regions. And you see each of these little black dots, those are uh, properties where we collected and, and uh, trapped live adult does that had already been bred. So this was after the breeding season. These bred does were brought back to Mississippi State University to our research facility. Here in, in the Lurse, uh, this is actually the thin Lurse, we uh, captured all at all these locations and brought back a collection of genetic variation within the thin Lurse region. And then we also captured the genetic characteristics of deer by capturing deer from the Delta region. So we brought back this genetic potential for body size and antler size back to Mississippi State. We let the wild captured females fawn in captivity. And that was really important. We wanted these fawns to be uh, produced in our pens so that they could be raised on optimum nutrition. The does, they had been raised on the nutrition from their respective regions, and so their body sizes were already determined. We wanted to look at the body growth of the babies from these females. We raised the first set of fawns, the first generation, that were produced by adult wild does. We raised them on optimum nutrition. And then we took the adult uh, males and females from the lower coastal plain and bred them and let them produce offspring. And that second set of offspring was called the second generation, which were offspring of the first generation that had been raised on optimum nutrition. And now this second generation was going to be raised on optimum nutrition. So we, we brought the genetics from each of the three regions and then started applying the same nutrition to these genetic uh, groups of animals. We measured body weights, body size, antler size. We, we darted every buck each year for three years, looking at body growth rates and antler growth rates. Uh, this is one of our fine uh, MSU Deer Lab graduate students, Eric Mitchell taking a measurement on one of the newborn fawns. So let's look at this, uh, the results from our manipulative study. I want to remind you that there's a lot of regional variation. This is the, the 20 inch difference in uh, antler size among the three regions. This figure shows the delta deer in red, the Lurse deer in blue and the lower coastal plain deer in yellow or gold. And this is antler size uh, of the first generation of deer. So we wanted to see if the antlers grown by Lurse Hill deer and lower coastal plain deer could catch up to what the Delta was growing. And we, after the first generation, the bucks with the genetics from the Lurse Hills compensated and equaled the antler size of bucks with genetics from the Delta. Now the lower coastal plain was still lagging behind by 13 inches. But you remember there was a 20 inch difference in the wild deer between the lower coastal plain and the Delta. After one generation, we were able to make that difference only 13 inches. And then the second generation, we proved that the lower coastal plain bucks could grow antlers just as big or equal to the Lurse Hills, and those antlers were just as big or equal to the bucks from the Delta. So we showed full compensation. We eliminated the variation in antler size by feeding them optimum nutrition. And they were all the same size after three years and two at three years of age over two generations. Let's look at this a little bit differently. 
let's remind you here of the antler score at three years of age in the wild. This is uh, three years of age, not five years that we, we talked about earlier, but our bucks here in our research were measured at three years of age, so I'm comparing it that way. Uh, the F1, the first generation, the Finlers bucks were seven inches larger than the wild bucks at three years of age in their region. The lower coastal plain bucks were 12 inches larger uh, in, in antler size than the wild harvested bucks in their region. Now in the delta, there was a little bit of a drop, but that, uh, that's not a significant drop, and that's just what we deal with in research. Sometimes you get some unusual variation. So the first generation will say it didn't change in the delta, but it did increase in the thin lurs and the lower coastal plain at three years of age. Now let's look at uh, the second generation, the F2s here in maroon compared to the wild in yellow and the first generation in blue. We see the Delta Bucks second generation bumped up 10 inches in antler size. The second generation of the Thin Lurse Bucks bumped up an additional four inches over the first generation. And look what the Lower Coastal Plain Bucks did. They bumped up a 21 inch increase in antler size from that second generation the optimum nutrition for two generations. So what we've shown here, and, and just in a different way in this figure, is the lower coastal plain bucks and the thin lurus bucks grew antlers just as big as the delta wild bucks. So if you're a hunter living in the lower coastal plain or in the thin lurus, and if you have antler envy, uh, you don't have to have that antler envy anymore if you have adequate nutrition. These increases in antler size are, are pretty si significant. Uh, this shows two bucks that were actually some of our study animals. We sedated them and took their pictures every year before we cut off their antlers. And the buck on the left is a lower coastal plain buck, first generation, that scored 95 inches. The second generation buck, represented by the buck in the right-hand picture, the second generation grew inch, uh, 116 inches of antler. So that's a 21 inch difference between the first and the second generation deer, and this is only due to nutrition. The same age bucks, same genetics in the population, in the sample. So uh, talking about three years of age, I just want to show it a little bit differently now. The three-year-old bucks, the D, uh, lower coastal plain, the DMAP bucks, the, the harvested bucks, 91, first generation, 95, and second generation, 116. Now, if we want to document what this change was, it's a, a gain in 25 inches over two generations of proper nutrition compared to what the deer were growing in the harvested DMAP data. 25 inch gain. Now let's project these antlers out to six years of age. The DMAP bucks would be about 121 inches. The first generation bucks projected out to six years of age is 127. The second generation bucks are 155 inches at six years of age. That's a 34 inch increase or gain from optimum nutrition applied over two generations. That's a phenomenal change in antler size for bucks in the lower coastal plain. So let's now talk about body size. Remember the difference in the, the three regions, about a 44 pound difference between the delta and the lower coastal plain and then the Lurse Hills somewhere in the middle there? Well, let's look at what happened in our manipulative study in the delta, we saw uh, from the wild to the first generation, an 18 pound increase. And then from the first generation to the second generation, another 18 pound increase in body weight. And here, we're not gonna take time to look at the Lurse Hills. We're just gonna look at the, the two uh, 
the big and the littler. And, and here we see the, the lower coastal plain wild deer in red and the blue uh, increased 12 pounds and then the, uh, in the first generation and then a 35 pound increase in the second generation. So that's just a phenomenal increase only due to nutrition. The same genetics in the lower coastal plain between the red, the blue, and the yellow, those are the same genetics. In the delta, the red, the blue, and the yellow, those are all the same genetics. It's the only thing that differs is nutrition. So let's look at this also from that uh, different point of view to remind you what the body weights are from the wild harvested deer in the delta, the thin lurse in the lower coastal plain at three years of age. In the first generation, good nutrition, increased nine pounds, increased nine pounds, increased one pound. So first generation, there was partial compensation. The thin lurse jumped up nine pounds, but also the delta jumped up nine pounds. And that kind of surprised us. I'll talk some more about that in, in a few minutes. Looking at the second generation body weights, here we have evidence of full compensation. The lower coastal plain bucks were now weighing the same as the wild harvested bucks from the delta. So the difference between body size in deer between the lower coastal plain and the delta, it's not genetics, it's nutrition. And these deer were measured at the same age at three years of age so that age is not a factor here and genetics is not a factor because we sampled a wide range of the genetics from each of the three regions to make up this study so genetics we controlled for age we controlled for we improved the nutrition and showed full body weight compensation so Antler size, fully compensated in two generations. So really the, the cause of the regional variation in Mississippi is nutrition. That nutrition is tied back to soil resource region differences, soil quality differences uh, that, that affect the plant quality, the ability to produce high quality forages, and it also relates back to land use differences but it all comes down to nutrition. We showed from our preliminary work, looking at soils and forages and land use, and then we proved with this manipulative study that it's all about nutrition. Now let's talk about that body size uh, compensated in, the, in the, the lower coastal plain and the thin lurs, just like uh, uh, the antlers, but also the body size of the delta deer continued to increase. Increased 36 pounds over two generations. So the delta was kind of our gold standard for what um, a big deer should look like in Mississippi. But we've shown through this manipulative research that our wild delta deer are also nutritionally limited. Even though they're the biggest wild deer in the state, they're not actually reaching their full genetic potential for antler size and body size. Our delta buck genetics exceeded the antler size and the body size genetics in, in the sample of wild harvested deer. So we have really no idea yet just how big our deer could get in Mississippi if we were to try to maximize the habitat quality, to maximize the nutritional intake of our deer populations. We would have loved to have taken this research another generation into a third or even a fourth generation to see just how big we could grow our Mississippi deer. But we answered the state agency's main question. We showed that it was not a genetic difference it was all about nutrition, and so our story ends there. But it really doesn't end in terms of deer management. 
There's a lot of things we can do to improve that habitat quality. So back just to summarize before I start talking about habitat management, habitat quality is what drives the regional variation. The nutrition matters, not just what the deer is eating today or this year, but what they ate in the past and what they eat in the future. And in fact, it's not just an individual year, it's generations. When you're managing for nutrition of a deer population, you have to think about generational management. The management actions you take to improve nutrition can fix regional differences in antler and body size. And we've been talking about Mississippi here, but if you are in just about any state in the United States, you will see regional variation in body and antler size of deer. It's a very common feature, and we believe that this research is applicable across the United States. If you have a region of your state that is uh, known for smaller, smaller bodied deer, smaller antlered deer, it's probably due to nutrition, not genetics, uh, provided they, they have the right nutrition and they reach the same age, they can, after a couple of generations, compensate and remove those regional differences.